Hey everyone, apologies, uh, some technical difficulties, but thank you for joining for another interview of the Korean Gaming Series. My name is Adam Shea, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the host of today's interview. Uh, this is actually our second interview for March, so kind of the bonus episode. Um, if you didn't see our interview with August Thursday, make sure to go check it out after this. Uh, before we begin, I just need to read you through ACM SIGGRAPH's policy for harassment and community guidelines. This slide stream is moderated by ACM SIGGRAPH. We ask that all comments stay respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. This means to exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your fellow participants. As always, we're looking to improve the series as we go, so if you have any thoughts or comments or feedback, uh, please feel free to drop it in the chat or comments. Lastly, we will be having Q&A at the end of the session, so also if you have any questions throughout the whole series, uh, drop it in the chat. So I'm so excited to bring on our next guest, Nick Marie. Nick is a London-based producer, composer, and artist, making interactive sonic and narrative work focusing on loss and digital cultures. Nick is also a producer for Now Play This, a festival of experimental game design running virtually this coming week. Hey, Nick, thanks for joining us. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so we actually met um, quite a few years ago now in 2016, 2017, uh, when we worked together at uh, Chisholm Hill Dance Space in London, not games. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then you messaged me a few months ago uh, when you noticed we'd both switched over. So, you know, small world. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And actually, I thought this was such a nice way to just be able to say hello again. Like, it's really lovely <laughs> to see you again. <laughs> yes, definitely. It's going to be great to catch up. Um, so just to start us off, uh, could you let us know what your pronouns are and how you identify? Uh, yeah, so uh, he, they. And um, I think uh, outside of that, everything is kind of fine. I... Uh, kind of don't won't won't uh kind of correct you on anything in particular because actually beyond that everything is okay awesome cool great <laughs> um so just to get started with your history of games um what like how did you start what how did you first become interested um so i started or i guess way back in terms of kind of playing games i've been playing games for for kind of years upon years, um, back with the kind of Game Boy Classic. Um, in terms of creating games, this came a lot slower and kind of more recently within the last maybe six years or so. Um, so I, I trained in art and uh, performance and a lot of that became interactive, um, blending uh, parts of digital with physical. And it just slowly became a really natural progression to uh, uh, explore that digital space a bit more, um, which is which kind of led on to kind of working with kind of actual kind of game designers. Um, I'm not, not sure if I'd still call myself that yet, but um, <laughs> yeah, pe people who have been kind of working within kind of game design, narrative design for a lot longer, and uh, realizing that a lot of these overlaps have been there for quite a while. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I feel like I've kind of gone <laughs> down to the question and not quite answered it. There, but, no, no uh, definitely. Um, and yeah, I have just like going through your projects, you've worked with like so many different mediums. So I was kind of hoping you could just walk through like what is your creative process and like how does the project first get started? Sure. Um, so like I say, a lot of my work is based around um, kind of art and uh, narrative. The, the use of, of interactive mediums came as, as a way of just trying to engage audiences in a slightly different way. Uh, I feel that, or have felt over the last few years that I've been able to kind of tap into uh, particular emotions in ways that you can't in kind of more passive uh, audience performer relationships. And mm -hmm. um, so in, in terms of uh, a process for kind of putting something together, I will generally start off with an idea, which is which will be quite amorphous. So uh, a lot of my work is is based around a really uh, a kind of larger kind of bracket of thinking around kind of loss in digital cultures. So a lot of that is like 
uh, kind of grief or death, but around the fact that we have the internet and, and kind of nothing is lost in terms of data and you can kind of search for all sorts of things all the time. Um, and so using a kind of really broad starting point like that, I'll kind of hone in on the particular uh, aspect of it that I'm looking at at the time. And from then take those steps to, to, to see what the right kind of form of um, kind of interaction is. So whether that's going down like a kind of point and click game that might be really narrative driven or something that's essentially like a digital toy that has really small kind of interactions that are quite subtle, but kind of feel poignant, that kind of thing. Um, and then comes kind of making it. I do the kind of majority of, of my kind of game design myself. So that's through kind of script writing, coding, um, uh, uh, soundtracks, uh, sound effects, that kind of thing. So it's um, it's a process that can take kind of different steps in different orders. But um, yeah, it'll start off with an idea and then be quite process heavy in terms of just working out what I want it to look like, and then playing around with that for a while, um, then working out how I want people to interact, and playing out with that with that for a while, and then kind of smushing them together and seeing kind of what comes out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So very much like a fluid process as you're you yeah. know, exploring yeah. your idea. Um, as someone who's worked with, like when you're talking about interactivity, like whether it's a point and click or like the physical object, um, what are like the main differences to you for something that's like digital compared to like an actual physical uh, interactivity? Um, great question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of that has been a lot of the last year has been me trying to answer that question mm. uh, in a, in a way that I thought I had answered previously. That there are very clear definitions between kind of physical objects and physical spaces, and then kind of digital and kind of net based work. But actually, um, there are all these overlaps that maybe we all took for granted for quite a long time, and uh, like all of all, all of the work I've been doing over the last. Uh, kind of year and a couple of months because like you know everything um, <laughs> has has been kind of asking that question of like what are the differences between kind of physical and digital spaces and are those differences there just because of tradition and just because of the way we've set those these things up and and should we be kind of changing that um before so end of 2019 i was working on a uh, narrative game called uh originally called dream phone and then dubbed uh, dial 555 uh which is a uh, uh, completely audio based uh narrative branching game housed in a physical telephone um which had to get shelved because we all kind of went into lockdown so i was then mm -hmm. thinking about whether that should be a digital game and what the what the benefits of that were or the the hindrances from taking away that physical object and I'm still trying to answer the question. <laughs> I've tried. I've I've now made a prototype of it fully digital, which means that now I've realised that it doesn't have to be completely audio. That um, it breaks off into having kind of uh, kind of pastiches of old games like Snake and Space Invaders, the kind of things that you'd have on like the old kind of brick mobile phone. Um, and uh, yeah, like I don't think that they are the same piece anymore. Like that's not a translation from physical to digital. Um, this is very much around kind of, <clears throat> kind of very specifically video games or mm -hmm. kind of that interaction in the physical space or digital space. I think that obviously it's going to change for kind of more performative works or installation things, kind of the escape room kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's it's that that level of interaction between the kind of participant and whatever the designer has intended uh, that kind of tweaks uh, kind of shifts back and forth between the kind of physical and digital. Interesting, yeah, for sure. And you know, like you talked about, like the lockdown has made plenty of new challenges, um, but or just like different ways to approach the problem or situation. And I'm just wondering. Like one of the things that I was thinking about uh, was like how you make tabletop games. A big challenge now is like you can't really play test with people since sure. there aren't people in physical space. Has any of like these new barriers been frustrating, or do you really just see it as like new opportunities or different ways to explore? 
uh, I think both of those happen kind of concurrently. <laughs> All yeah. through the last year, both of those have been a, a thing. That frustration is is constant because you just want to fall back on the things that you know work and you know are easy. And that is like calling up three of your friends and saying, I've got this weird idea for a game. Um, can you try and test it out for me? Um, but then also things have come out of that frustration, like um, using uh, platforms like Tabletop Simulator or Tabletopia, mm. where you can test the, the mechanics of a game. Uh, all the way through to the kind of subtle, it's more subtle uh, kind of implicit mechanics of just picking up a, a card. You have to do these things in like tabletop simulator um, to make it work because they're not automated. Um, yeah, there, there's been a lot of exploration into like new platforms and, or not even new platforms, like um, that last year we were playing around with, with Now Play This, playing around with the ideas of doing things through Discord, through uh, kind of Google Docs and Sheets, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, reusing uh, the, the spaces we already have in a, mm -hmm. in a kind of way to see what, what new things we could get out of them. For sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so also, you were, you've talked a lot about how, like, you've been exploring what does it mean to like take something that was originally intended for physical into the digital? For things that you would always plan to be digital, has like the past year changed like what you're interested in exploring in any way? Um, yeah, I think that the the kind of context for a lot of the the digital work I've been doing has changed. So, just because like lockdown is ever present, a lot of the the things that I've been thinking about have now been kind of framed in that context. So kind of bringing in the idea, sorry, I have a cat in front of me. Thanks for guest. Yeah, exactly. Uh, where was I? Yeah, so, so bringing in things like the idea of isolation and kind of new distances um, have become, uh, whether I like it or not, new parts of games that I'm designing. Because I think that, that if, if I didn't, if I wasn't kind of, bringing that awareness off this, off kind of our current situation, that would be read into by players because it's kind of, it's everywhere. We're all experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And and without bringing that that kind of awareness or reflection in, in the writing, I think it would become lacking. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Yeah, no matter what, like the audience is going to bring in their experiences and this is kind of unavoidable. Even, you know, like major projects that took years like we're still talking about it in the context of exactly like, COVID, right. just because that's when it came out yeah yeah like I, I played um last year in kind of the first few months of lockdown i decided to give death stranding a go mm -hmm. that came out a year beforehand but it basically feels like the lockdown game mm -hmm. so yeah like everything's gonna gonna have the context of of the, of the now isn't it for sure yeah um, so looking like at some of the games that you've made, uh, we played a lot of them on uh, itch.io, uh, you cool. seem to have an overarching theme of creating these quiet, contemplative moments. And I was just wondering, is it important for you as a creator to like be providing these moments? Um, I guess first off, thanks for noticing. <laughs> like <laughs> that's definitely what what um I'm trying to trying to kind of convey with a lot of these. Um yeah, it's definitely important, I think. Uh because this this is one of the the questions that um, you sent over, and so I was thinking about this in advance. And it's very hard to think about it in terms of like the newer stuff I'm making, because a lot of the things on itch are very small, like very uh, kind of complete thoughts in themselves. Like they take you know like a minute to three minutes to play, and that's it. And you can kind of get all of it in that time. And the things I'm making now are taking me kind of months and haven't really seen, seen the light of day. So they, they kind of take up a bit more, which is uh, in, a, in a good way, they take up a few more emotions than just that one of taking like a, a moment to have a complete com contemplative silence. But um, I think that it's, it's definitely a part of my kind of design practice to try and create these spaces. Um, like I was saying, a lot of my work is, is based around the idea of, of, having a lot of these emotions in parallel with existing alongside the internet. And like the internet is 
this is a personal feeling but the internet is so noisy <laughs> like there is mm -hmm. constant noise from you know every everything like social media platforms adverts all of it and this is not to say that that's a bad thing like having this this wealth of information is incredible but i i do enjoy being able to, to kind of provide that space that while, while it's still in this digital kind of realm we haven't had to kind of completely step away it can be quiet for a couple of minutes and you know become quite internal like none of none of my games have very complex uh uh, kind of control patterns either control systems either like you have one or two buttons so you don't really ever have to think too hard about what you're doing within it for sure yeah and it was honestly really refreshing for someone that plays you know just very much like the traditional triple a games like the first project i played of yours i just like rushed through it and it wasn't until like okay i need to go back and like actually take in like what i'm i supposed to be experiencing there um, and it was honestly like, so I, we, this question was actually brought up by a moderator. We uh, discussed your projects yesterday and it was just like a really nice time to like reflect on work again. I feel like we haven't really had that since I'm used to getting it, like watching a dance performance live and then discussing with friends afterwards. And this was kind of like yeah. bringing that back to, you know, go into your little art gallery and experience everything you had and then yeah. kind of discuss what our thoughts were. Yeah, um, well, I'm so glad. That's a, that's a really lovely thing to say. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, something I did notice in like your works is um, you uh, like in your description you normally write it's about this, maybe, um, or maybe this. And yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, is are there a certain message you're trying to convey to the viewer, or do you intentionally want it to be very open ended? um god i'd love to have a really brilliant answer for this <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i think that with all of these things i make um there's a certain element of them still being questions for me mm. um i'm still kind of toying around with what's what's going on with them while i'm making them and also trying not to force a particular uh kind of message through through the games on other people and like the easiest way to do that is just to throw a maybe on the end there like it's a kind of playful question mark to say that like this is this is what i've been thinking about and this is how i'm kind of putting it out there but at no point do i want you to have to think that that's what this is about you can kind of take any part of these games for yourself like once once you're playing once you're playing one of these games it's very much your own experience and not mine anymore regardless of whether they're kind of autobiographical or not yeah, that's an amazing mindset, you know, because it's very much, it's great to hear about, like, what the artist had in mind and, like, what their process was. But at the end of the day, it really is the audience number to take away whatever they want from it. So I love that you kind of just already had that embedded. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a good amount of your pieces are poetry, um, but you do always tend to include an interactive aspect. How do you strike the right balance between poetry and the interaction? um great question again <laughs> i think uh so this comes comes back to something that I, I mentioned very briefly before that through interaction or i guess before that like i have a history of uh have kind of different different career paths and before game design there was a period where i was working in poetry and publishing and kind of creative writing short stories that kind of thing and like i love it i still absolutely love it but there was a moment when I realized that there are certain emotions that it's a lot easier to explore with interaction. So like in, you know, your favorite kind of page turner, you can kind of feel that the joy and elation alongside any of these characters, but in a kind of choose your own adventure even, which could be kind of page based, or like kind of print based or any kind of, um, kind of choice based game up from there you're suddenly being able, you're suddenly able to tap into things that deal with like responsibility and guilt uh it's very hard to feel feel guilt secondhand for someone else in a book mm -hmm. i feel um and so that's where bringing this interactivity into things that have a kind of poetic leaning uh where where those two things kind of tie together um you suddenly have an agency 
that you might not have had in a poetic work. So like even just kind of just taking, for example, like um, the Tamagotchi game that's Tamagotchi Seance. Um, at each point, you have to make a choice to, to continue the conversation. Um, and the conversation isn't particularly deep. Like you don't kind of find out any of these uh, kind of secret truths or anything, but you have to at every single point make the decision to kind of keep going or leave um which you can really do like there's there's an element of that if you're reading on 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 paper like you can close a book but I, most books don't tell you like every paragraph do you want to stop maybe maybe we should stop <laughs> like it happen you know yeah i love that you brought that up that was actually going to my next question um like yeah if you want to be really meta like you can always quit the game but a lot of your works actually have this like constant or not a constant but like the player always has agency in regards to like they must be present uh it's mm. so, like the tamagotchi like yeah there's an explicit option to walk away uh waiting for godots is that how you oh, say Godot, it yeah yeah Godot. so that's okay that's a, that's a a trickier one to kind of bring in because technically that's like that's like a cover like that's like my cover album of something <laughs> different but yeah exactly like you are you're given that that um option to kind of stay or go mm -hmm. and then even yeah. for uh ping it's like if you're not like constantly interacting with it like you then lose out on the poetry and the narrative mm -hmm. is that like an intentional thread that you've been doing or does it just kind of been naturally occurring based on you exploring the other themes um it's definitely intentional but i think the more i do it the more natural it becomes so I'm definitely looking at with with these games, definitely looking at that that feeling of being present on the internet and being present with these kind of digital mediums. Um, so yeah, like that that's definitely something that, whether it's kind of at the forefront of my kind of design um, kind of plan or not, it's always it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, sure. and then so another just like big part of games is shifting the. A perspective of the player to maybe one that they're not always familiar with. Um, is there a personal philosophy you draw from when creating these perspectives? Um, I think that kind of personal philosophy makes it sound very grand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think there's anything that grand. Um, a lot of the work that I'm making is it comes from like they, they say, write what you know, or kind of things along that line. And these are the, the games that I'm making are definitely coming from kind of narrative places that I'm exploring personally. So I'm not, I'm absolutely not trying to put the, the player in my shoes, but maybe by, okay, and extending the metaphor, <laughs> taking my shoes off and putting them so that someone else could see them, uh, making the, making like the personal a bit more universal. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that that's, the closest thing I can get to a kind of philosophy in this that uh yeah uh anything that comes from a personal space just giving it those two steps of metaphor or two steps of just removal um makes it easier for other people to step into that that shape and then kind of play the game through that interesting okay um even with like that removal you're talking about like originally it coming from you it feels like it requires a lot of just being open and maybe vulnerability is that ever something you struggle with when creating or does it um, help to like yeah uh for a long time i thought that and and to an extent still do like the work that i'm making digitally and in these kind of small games is very much about vulnerability it's about exploring very uh kind of uh kind of vulnerable making emotions and situations um but I have been talking with uh, a good friend and longtime collaborator, um, Abby Palmer, who I mentioned before we started the stream, actually, who um, is, oh, sorry. I, I don't know if that's coming through. Uh, not much, I don't think. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, I was talking with Abby Palmer about um, the idea of vulnerability in my games. And uh, I'm so sorry. Give me one second. Yeah, you're fine.
so I, I have kind of noise bleeding through. No worries. Um, yeah, and realizing that actually by doing this, this, this creation of the universal in a lot of these games, perhaps I'm not dealing with kind of the vulnerability that would come from actual autobiographical games. So there's, there's a line I'm definitely toying in between the two that I think that vulnerability, it's definitely not explored enough in kind of bigger games, I think. Uh, there are kind of very traditional roles of the hero that have to be adhered to in kind of double and triple A games because that's just how how we kind of know the blockbuster. Um, so it's it's a yeah, I think it's a light touch in vulnerability. Uh, enough for people to kind of think about it, but not too much to like I think a lot of my games are very melancholy. And so I try to actively not make them real just downers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that, like, for me, the vulnerability played through and that, like, because it wasn't something I was used to seeing, I felt kind of, like, voyeuristic, like, experiencing mm. it. Like, oh, am I really supposed to be intruding on, like, these thoughts or whatever? So it was, it was right. a really interesting experience to, like, be able to share that with us. Yeah, so. yeah that's super interesting, yeah. Um, so at least just like coming from the US side, uh, game development does feel very like industry and commercially driven. Uh, as someone who's more in like the art space, how is the work perceived over there in the UK? Um, I think we have a fairly similar uh, kind of viewership of kind of games on both sides, like the industry and the art side. Um, I, I think I, I have a, a unique privilege of working for with Now Play This, like which is very much straddling both and um, can comfortably sit within both, that I see that there is a, like a real kind of industry focus for games here as well. But mm. I think that the, the, the acceptance and the kind of want for games that are a bit weirder and small and, you know, like kind of poorly crafted sometimes because that's just not, we're not looking for that kind of sheen. Like it's it's something else that's important. It's definitely growing. Yeah, um, we are. I, I think that games are always, or kind of up till now, are still a few steps behind other kind of traditional mainstream media. So we're still coming up with like the terminology for a lot of these kind of more arty games. Like I know that things. It's a lot of things like just the, the kind of portmanteau of art game or new media writing, these kind of things are being kind of bandied about a lot. Um, and while they do fit for some things, it's not perfect, but it, it definitely shows that people are talking about it. People are trying to um, uh, see where these slightly weirder things fit. Definitely. And like you said about how it's growing, I think that's, at least sort of a nice thing about us all being stuck online, because uh, I feel like they do get more attention now compared to like, uh, you know, just being in like an art gallery or something that's normally more constricted to like cities or yeah. big cultural hubs. So it's nice to get to expand out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, like that's something we've been thinking about with Now Play This as well, that before it was very kind of city centric, like it was in Somerset House in the center of London. so. Uh, that limits the audience like by just necessity and last year when we did the first kind of fully online one we were uh, kind of seeing audience members come in for live events from across the globe it was incredible it was really cool to see definitely shifting over to now play this uh it's launching march 25th uh for the 2021 festival could you just tell us a bit about what now play this is and how it originated yeah. of course yeah so Now Play This is a festival of experimental game design and playful arts. Um, the first one was 2015, started by the incredible curators uh, Holly Gramazio and V. Buckingham. And um, it's, it's based at, in kind of normal, a normal festival is based at Somerset House, which is a cult cult cultural institution in the center of London. Um, over a weekend or up till in 2019, it was nine days, a nine day long festival. There are, there'll be a kind of 
official selection of curated games that are housed in uh, specially made uh, cabinets or with uh, kind of specially created controllers, things that kind of really elevate the experience of uh, trying these games. Um, there will be usually a kind of conference strand so that we have kind of talks and workshops around the artistry of gaming, uh, the kind of game design side itself. Um, yeah, really trying to take in all of the different aspects of what kind of put these things together. Sure. <clears throat> so this is now the second year of running the festival virtually, um, although maybe not quite as unexpected as 2020 was to you guys. Um, what did you learn from the last one that you brought over and how are you approaching things differently now? Uh, so the biggest difference is that last year we had two weeks <laughs> to turn <laughs> the entire thing around. Um, we we obviously thought long and hard, but made the the right decision to uh, cancel the the IRL festival, and we we yeah by the by the time we had kind of made that decision properly and gone through it with all of our partners. We basically had two weeks to put together a new festival online because we were determined to do something. We wanted to kind of create uh, something special that um, reflected how we feel about the, the festival in real life, in physical space, not real life, like it's all real. Um, so yeah, this year has been a joy to have, you know, a good good few months to to think about what we want to do. So we've had time to explore the theme, um explore how different artists are relating to that and how we can kind of best curate that and prepare that for an audience who by now might be kind of struggling with a lot of online uh events just because it's all we've had so yeah it's been a real kind of privilege to be able to think about how to present these things in a way that doesn't take too much emotional energy or too much bandwidth from you know an audience that has to exist online right now that's <clears throat> such a great point yeah we talk about all the time now about being like zoomed out or just yeah, like exactly. even though it looks like it doesn't require effort like it's exhausting, it's exhausting <laughs> quite yeah. yeah um on like the artist side have they talked about how they're like approaching things differently for this conference or conference festival um um yeah so i i guess that the the best example is that we have a couple of artists who we did work with last year as well just because their their kind of uh, body of work has expanded and taken in kind of themes that we're looking at as well and so it's been interesting to be able to speak to them over the course of you know a year and a bit from knowing them as artists who have work in physical spaces to doing a couple of online festivals um yeah, I think everybody is quietly preparing for being able to put work out in in you know the way that we're all used to, but I don't think anyone was surprised to to have to go online again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's something that most of the artists that I've I've spoken to have had in the, the kind of back of their head for for months. Yeah. Sure. And so this year's theme is exploring the relationship between play, games, and the climate crisis. Uh, could you tell us about what inspired that? Um, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a very pressing concern. It's a very pressing yes. concern. And um, our festival director for this year and kind of ongoing is a kind of brilliant artist called Sebastian Quack, who's based over in Berlin. and um, we've been chatting about it for quite a few months like originally we were chatting about using this as as the theme when it would have been a physical festival and how uh we would be able to explore kind of all of our little interactions that that contribute to the the climate crisis in in this institutional space that um like in in a city that is you know constantly churning out all sorts of things um so yeah, it, it shifted then when we had to go online and has just been a really kind of actual really fun experience, despite it being such a kind of sombering subject matter, such some sombering sub subject matter, because there are 
people kind of who are just using such uh, inventive and kind of playful methods to be able to highlight the fact that there is a kind of global crisis going on that we're in the midst of. It's not the kind of beginning. Uh, we are w well into it. Mm -hmm. So along that, um, I noticed each day has like a particular theme and uh, like I felt like the Friday is the very more traditional when it comes to, like when we talk about climate change, it's very like action oriented. How can we solve it um, compared to Saturday is a bit more somber in that it asks what if the player doesn't have the power to do that um, or what if it's irreparable? Uh, I'm curious, how did these motifs, motifs like come into play? Uh, so, in previous years, we've uh, structured the festival by room, so kind of curated it to have particular themes as as one would be walking through the space, games would be grouped in a particular way. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was an attempt to try and do that in a digital space as well, give a really kind of honed... Uh, Kind of subject for a day to be able to think about one aspect of the climate crisis and um yeah kind of take it as far as one could in in that day mm -hmm. so we've managed to kind of combine events with um the official selection as well which is also grouped into these these four um kind of subheadings as it were yeah so you can you can kind of come in on any particular day, see the events for that, and play a small handful of games that we think really touch on that that particular topic. For sure, yeah. Um, stated on the site, one of the perks that you guys talked about uh, that having it virtually is sustainability, which is very relevant to the theme. Um, you know, just for example, people don't have to fly in, and we also talked about how making the festival virtually is just like far more accessible in general. Yeah. Uh, do you see these aspects continuing in the future and in what ways? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it's going to take some planning and it's going to take a little bit more time than we usually set aside. But I think that having this this kind of digital track is, from from here on, I think it's going to be essential for so many arts and games institutions. Like the the audience and especially the audience interaction that we've had over the kind of last year from in the festival itself last year and kind of throughout the year and even leading up to this one has been kind of really exceptional like we've had we've, we've been able to have conversations that we wouldn't have had otherwise like it's very hard to be able to sit down with an audience member uh during a kind of real festival because generally i'm probably running from one end of the building to the other with like a drill because the cabinet's falling apart maybe or like um, yeah just a, a game we'll need kind of tinkering with so um yeah like having a, a, just as an example that kind of comes to mind when we did the festival last year um we streamed everything through twitch and there would be kind of really wonderful moments to see where the twitch audience would kind of split off like while watching the the event they'd have their own kind of um side chat about kind of further reading to 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 really get into what the event is about or like other games that they should play or to, like afterwards this kind of thing so yeah like i think it would be uh such a shame to lose that um going ahead yeah we'll we'll definitely have something probably not to the same degree but mm -hmm. some kind of digital track running in parallel with the with the physical exhibition from here on Awesome. That's really great to hear. Um, my last question for you uh, is just, is there any specific works or talks that you're most excited about for the festival? Um, yeah, so I guess on a, on a personal level, there are, uh, there's a, a pair of artists called um, Milana Nielsen uh, Kawana Safrata, who are uh, Canadian artists, digital artists, and I think that their work is very it's it's very inspirational for the the work that I make and we had them on last year and to have them back with a very very different piece this year um is is really cool <laughs> um the piece in question is called uh, the garden of earthly delights and it is it's based off age of empires 2 but it's sort of a chat room but everyone is an animal 
from Age of Empires 2. <laughs> and um, you kind of just flit about this, this kind of very traditionally set, almost kind of painterly space, just talking to other animals, and occasionally you get eaten by a lion. <laughs> hard to describe but it's actually very powerful <laughs> um other things that are uh kind of really really tickling me about this this year's festival are actually more some of the more event-based things like we have a couple of uh online larps going on so one is a very traditional um almost like a kind of model un but based around the idea of kind of solving the climate crisis whether that's even possible and how you do that. And another one is kind of on the complete other side of the, the, the spectrum where you, you go in and you're invited to become anything like a, a fish or a rock or a slime mold. And the whole idea is that by creating these non-human uh, characters, this, this online LARP becomes a space where we can kind of think about uh, the climate crisis and the world in general from a from a point of view that's not specifically human or kind of anthropocentric. Um, that's called the uh, Summit for Intergalactic Knowledge, in case anyone listening wants to to check it out. Um, yeah, they, these are the things that I've been kind of really, really excited to to kind of just see when they come together. Yeah. That they both sound amazing. And that's something I really love about this festival is even though everyone's online, like, the way they're still able to explore like such vastly different mediums or like ways to approach it is just really interesting. Yeah. Um, I started checking out just like one of the games on there. I think it's called like Floating Point. And oh yeah, it was just like an it, yeah yeah, uh, and just the way that they were like able to bring in like actually destroying like the engine you're playing in or like actually like turning the faults into a feature seems it was just really yeah. interesting to experience. Yeah, um, really, really little game. I love it. I absolutely love it. I say I say little. Actually, that's really kind of. I don't mean that in the kind of derogatory way. It's just it is a short piece, mm -hmm. but so much is happening in it. You you destroy the entire world. <laughs> like that's yeah. huge. So yeah, yeah. Nice. And yeah, we'll be dropping a link to the festival in the comments. Um, I believe it is free, correct, but donation based. Um, yeah, absolutely. People. So every everything is free. Everything will be streamed on our website, so nowplaythis.net, and on our Twitch page uh, for people who want to kind of comment, um, including all of the timed events. Everything is kind of free to attend. Um, it's really important for all of us that everything is accessible to kind of the highest degree throughout this. Mm. Um, and yeah, we're kind of uh, offering the 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 idea for donations through a kind of festival pass. If anyone wanted to donate, then they can kind of get a print and play festival lanyard where you kind of fill in different symbols and things and kind of uh, a kind of silly way to to heighten the, the festival experience, like to have that ticket that we all used to have. Right. <laughs> Feels good to just have that physical. It does. Thing yeah. In um, so we actually have some really great questions uh, from our commenters, and as we're talking, please feel free to drop some more. Uh, but just starting with uh, Hannah L. Hood on YouTube, they wrote, given we've all spent perhaps more time immersed in the type of quiet contemplation your games are cited this year compared to others, um, have you found that audience reactions to your games have changed at all? Interestingly, I've found that people have engaged more with my games this year, which means that I can't quite say whether I know if the reaction has changed, but there's definitely been, I think, more of a desire for this kind of game. More people have been kind of tuning in, like even like like we mentioned, the, the kind of Tamagotchi Seance game has been uh, kind of commented on or kind of discussed in a much higher detail than it had been before. I think that it, it maybe it resonates. Maybe these games, kind of smaller contemplative games, resonate a bit more now. Um, that is that is very much an assumption, though. I, <laughs> like I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's what I was planning. That's interesting, and I I feel like also just in general, like it kind of just speaks to like our desire for more interaction. Like before the pandemic, I was very much just like a consumer or like lurker compared to now i'm very much more like i'm gonna comment on this youtube video like yeah right 
yeah, but, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm exactly the same. Exactly the same. And that's probably something I, I'm going to try and unpick at some point, maybe with a small game. But yeah, like that need for interaction both ways is is really important. And with yeah, having only the kind of internet or kind of digital spaces to do it, we do tend to like go for that kind of YouTube comment because actually probably does mean a whole lot to the person who's being commented on. But we just don't really think about it like that for for we, we didn't previously, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh but it's awesome that you're experiencing that as well. Um Link on Facebook wrote, Can you talk about your process regarding the early development stage of your game ideas? Do you get your concept decided completely before stepping forward in production, or do you allow the game's development to stay fluid and change over the production time? Uh, very good question. I tend to have a fairly uh, kind of loose idea to start with. Things are, with, with the games I'm making, even, even if they have a, a kind of overarching narrative structure, I very rarely put the whole thing together at the beginning and then kind of stick to that as I go through. It'll have particular points. Like I, I tend to use kind of post-it notes and things like that and just put things in a line, like you'll be here and then if you click this, maybe you'll go here and do that onwards. With the, the beautiful, beautiful thing about using post-its is that, is that I will then pick them up and move them all around so that things are in a very different uh, iteration because often that's better. <laughs> like my first idea is never the best. Um, so, so yeah, like using that kind of mentality, I kind of create all of the games that I'm, I'm kind of, especially the things that I'm working on now. So I'm working on, as, as I said before, some quite um, kind of mo much more expansive games. And each of those, even though they are, uh, kind of much longer in their in in the kind of time that you're playing them and have much much deeper kind of interactions in terms of branches and things. They still have that kind of very loose narrative. Like I know what what I want people to feel, and I kind of have some kind of almost like in in AAA's how they have kind of set pieces, um, things kind of similar to that, like kind of conceptual set pieces that I know I want to touch on. But then a lot of the bits in between come from uh, kind of making it and then playing it myself and seeing how it's working for me, um, tweaking things along the way. Yeah, I try not to make everything. I try not to make the, the idea that I set out with. Interesting. Yeah. And that's, I mean, really across the board about how like game design is extremely iterative, but when it is on like a more smaller scale and you have that like flexibility to really be able to shake things up is you know mm -hmm. i think just great for the art process <laughs> um jaren on youtube wrote do metaverses of your like second life inform how you blend spaces today oh that's a great question yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely um so i before even before kind of lockdown and things i've spent a lot of time online like i kind of interact through or, or i really enjoy kind of interacting through all these these kind of mediated spaces that we have whether they are um kind of like the actual like second life capital s capital l or um like animal crossing these kind of things um i find it very very interesting how we interact with each other when suddenly you are limited to a handful of interaction like kind of actions um whether that's like even even just using something like kind of discord if you're in a text channel the limit of now being text based as opposed to voice based is something we're all really really used to but it's huge um and i think that this might just be because i make this kind of game but i do think about this kind of thing a lot in my day-to-day -day life as well yeah. um yeah, I think that probably over the last year, I've tried to keep them a bit more separate. But um, yeah, I, I, using these these different spaces that we that we kind of play and communicate in and kind of interact in, um, I think it's probably affected all of us. Um, we're going to have to go back to working out how to talk to people without a little uh, ourselves in the corner and. Um, the kind of mediation of, of emojis and stuff like that. Yeah. 
I hope that answers the question. I did ramble a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And I, I feel like like that's definitely something I think about too, just like especially being like a production role where communication is so important. Like when you are just limited to like the text on a screen, like it's much more difficult to like interpret meaning behind it or like read it. It's easy to read into things too. Yeah. <laughs> but right. yeah, it definitely creates new challenges. Um, I've become very heavily reliant on emojis now. <laughs> Uh, don't worry i'm happy <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah right. but uh it looks like our last question from Raphael on youtube is what are your opinions on the current mainstream representation of lgbtq plus people i assume in gaming right oh gaming yes <laughs> <laughs> um god so i don't play a huge amount of triple a games one of the reasons of which not the main reason like there are several reasons like and and not all of them huge kind of lofty concepts like this some of them are just you know like price or mm -hmm. not that interested but one of the reasons is definitely that a lot of triple a games look the same and have the same people in like i'm currently playing um assassin's creed odyssey uh it was on kind of in a steam sale and like I realized that after about an hour or so, I I was just playing The Witcher. It is just The Witcher 3, right? <laughs> um, don't comment me on this, please, anybody listening. <laughs> this was after about an hour. So obviously none of the storyline had kind of taken place or anything, but the interactions I was having and the kind of, even the way I'm riding this horse, it feels very samey. So actually, I play a lot more really, really indie games, the kind of things that are on itch often free because they're going to be weird and there's this kind of inbuilt uh, kind of tradition that you put your weird stuff out for free because because it's weird and you want people to be able to try it out before they have a kind of buy-in but that's where I find that the representation of um, kind of in in all areas suddenly is is, is able to flourish because there isn't a company on top saying you really can't do that because that's not going to sell. Um, yeah, I struggle with representation in kind of bigger games, in uh, kind of double and triple, triple A games. Um, I'm really trying to like have a counter to that and just think of a really good example of, of representation that I found recently in a game, but it's really hard off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. Within those indie titles, is there any that really stand out to you? So I feel like a lot of games, like indie and art gaming along a lot of it, and I'm thinking about things that like to toy with narrative and uh, kind of the, the space that you're inhabiting digitally as opposed to like a mechanic, like um, you're not like basically games where you're not really trying to win. <laughs> I feel like those are inherently queer spaces. Like that is an inherently queer space. Um things that come off the top of my head. So all all of the work of um, Danielle Braithwaite-Shirley, who is a London and Berlin-based artist, uh, all of their work is, they are games. They're fundamentally games. You go in, it's a 3D space, and you can walk around. Um, outside of that, they are sometimes disorientating or really challenging, um, but the the kind of, fundamental notion behind them is that through the digital world we can reclaim uh kind of black spaces and specifically black trans spaces um so i think that's that's a very kind of immediate uh example but um i think there are a lot a, a lot out there in in these spaces where things are a bit more nebulous where people aren't Basically, where people probably have another day job and they're making games because that is their medium for art. Amazing, yeah, definitely got to check that person out. But um, and I love how you talked about like what necessarily you know makes a queer space. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be about like inherent narrative per se. Um, yeah. But I think yeah, yeah, absolutely. As as we kind of were chatting before the stream started. Um, one of your colleagues was talking about just representation in terms of 
knowing that someone is queer. Like they might not be talking about having a queer experience. Like I think that's huge. Um, and that's that's kind of what I mean in terms of a lot of games just being in queer spaces. Like you don't have to be kind of, you don't have to fit into a traditional uh, mold. You don't have to be, essentially you don't have to kind of pass. Like whereas a lot of these kind of AAA games, that's the whole reason that they're made. They have to pass in a particular way so that they will kind of be bought by the largest amount of people. Um, I think another game designer, and maybe a kind of obvious choice. I feel like this is this is this is every queer game designer's go-to, like mine included. <laughs> um, the artist um, Robert Yang, who makes a lot of games about very specifically about being queer uh, mm. or about being gay and male, um, and that's kind of an interesting one because them being queer spaces is not necessarily the most important thing anymore. They feel like visual and interactive explorations almost in the kind of essay style of an aspect of queer culture so yeah there are there are also kind of different ways of inhabiting this queer space in gaming definitely for sure uh well we are approaching the end of our hour so um thank you so much for a bit (laughs) <laughs> no, no, it was amazing. It was all, it was perfect. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate you taking the time with us so much. It was super informative and oh, insightful. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Really before lovely. we let you go, is there anything else uh, you want to plug or talk about before we let you go? I guess the big thing, the big one is now play this coming up um, Thursday to Sunday. So that's the 25th to the 28th. Um, we have a few slots in all of the, almost all of the, the, uh, live events so please do go along and have a look to see if there's anything that um, piques your interest um, also check out the kind of official selection on there which will be available throughout the weekend um, personally I am always more than happy to kind of talk through my practice or just kind of interactive arts and gaming in general so if um, if anyone has any other questions that maybe they didn't have I'm always on Twitter to kind of chat through anything um, I think that's it. Awesome. And where are you at on Twitter? Uh, I am Cassette Witch on Twitter. C A W S E W T E W I T C H. (laughs) Awesome. Cool. And we'll be dropping the link to that as well as to now play this in the comments. Um, But yeah, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a really lovely chat. And yeah, like I say, really lovely to see you after so many years. Yeah, I love it. Probably not without a huge audience, but we'll just catch up. (laughs) For sure, for sure. Awesome. Well, you have a great evening. You too, you too. I guess afternoon for you. Yes, yes it is.